This is an RNZ podcast. Last weekend here on Media Watch, we heard from Dominion Post editor Anna Fifield about the dilemmas involved in covering this protest playing out in her paper's patch. And she told us she was anxious not to amplify messages that were rooted in misinformation and conspiracy theories, including, for example, some protesters' paranoid claims that the government was hiding crucial COVID facts. But the same weekend, the Dominion Post launched its own new effort to highlight cases of the public service not revealing things of genuine public interest to the Dominion Post. Every Saturday, under the banner, What We Didn't Learn This Week, the Weekend Dom Post will list questions that it put to public agencies the previous week, which didn't get answered fully or at all by them. Now, Anna Fifield herself kicked off this the previous weekend in a piece that was provocatively headlined, When Did Our Public Service Get So Arrogant? She said that open government appears to be on the wane now, and she blamed the growth in what she called the communications industrial complex. Vast battalions of people who work to deflect and avoid, or answer only in the most oblique manner possible, she said. We journalists, she complained, are vastly outnumbered by spin doctors. Now this isn't a new grievance. New Zealand journalists know many of those spin doctors she was writing about because many are former colleagues who were enticed out of newsrooms by bigger pay packets over the years. And the inside knowledge they have of how the media works is their key asset. And all questions now go through the communications professionals, Anna Fifield complained, rather than to the relevant experts or public officials. And almost always, she said, the answers come via email, insufficient and written in bureaucraties. Now, Anna Fifield said that this comes from the very top down at this government. It's part of the communication strategy of Jacinda Ardern herself. And in the background, there's also long-running journalists' anger about the way that under successive governments, the Official Information Act has been used or misused by politicians and public servants. But is the official obstruction and obfuscation that Anna Fifield complained about really any worse here than in any of the other countries where she's worked as a journalist? First up, I was writing not about COVID information, but about all of government, the lack of transparency that we have encountered, whether it's from MPI or the Ministry of Foreign Affairs or Waka Kotahi, like it seems to be pervasive uh, across government. And also, I'd like to say, you know, I know that there are a lot of very hardworking, very expert public servants out there who are trying to do their job. My point was that there is this battalion of communications people, gatekeepers, whose job seems to be to stop the media ever being able to talk to those experts, the people who know what they're talking about, about very complicated issues like three waters reforms or healthcare reforms and and things like this. So yes, there is this kind of spin cycle around many other countries in the world. And maybe I hold my own country to a higher standard, you know, because I obviously feel differently about this one. Um, But, you know, having spent 20 years overseas and coming back, I've been really surprised at how entrenched these spin doctor gatekeepers have become and how obstructive they are compared to other places where I've worked, like the UK, the US, Japan, South Korea, where it is possible. Of course, you have to call the communications people, but it is possible to talk to the officials involved and get answers out of them. Sometimes, of course, there are tough questions that need tough answers, but often it's about information, the free flow of information. So, for example, when I was at the White House during the Obama administration and that uh, administration was embarking on health care reforms, immigration reforms, it was really standard for a group of reporters to go into the White House and to have an hour with people who were in charge of those reforms, who knew the ins and outs. And you could ask questions, they would explain things to you, so you got a really good understanding of of what was going on and what they were trying to do. And, you know, you can ask stupid questions. We are generalists. I am not an expert in um, transmission gully PPP type projects and things. So I think that kind of background briefing is really, really beneficial both to the authorities and to the media because we can't explain things to the broader public when we don't understand them ourselves. So I've been really dismayed that there's no willingness in the public service to engage in that way. Plus, I mean, of course, we do ask lots of uncomfortable questions that the government would rather not answer. Um, But so the complete 
blockage on that, the, the fact that you can ask a DHB how many ICU beds they have, and they won't answer. They will make you put in an Official Information Act request for something that is just a number. I find that really, really alarming. But if there's one of your reporters wants to contact someone they've dealt with in the news before on, in their particular round, what actually happens here? Do they phone the individual, whether it's someone up say Waka Kotahi, about... Transmission Gully, which you're running a campaign on now, uh, someone who really knows what's going on with the, the testing and the, that's causing delays to the opening of, of the motorway. And do they just say, look, I'm sorry, I can't talk to you. You will need to go to our communications team. You can't quote me. I'm not allowed. Is, is that what happens? Sometimes, yes. Um, more often it has to go through the communications team. Like We might not have phone numbers or what have you, and the, that will just be send in your questions and you'll get an emailed response back, maybe attributed to that person, but no, I don't know that that person ever said those words. So there is no uh, – op- and the problem with email, right, there's no opportunity for back and forth. You can't say, oh, I don't understand this part. Can you explain it in a timely way or in an intelligible way often? And, you know, it comes back in kind of turgid officialese uh, and not in kind of everyday conversational language, the kind of thing that you would have in a conversation. Um, so it's that inability to have a back and forth uh, that I find alarming. Well, I've, I've even encountered that myself in my little area of the media. So even, me, even media companies, news media companies will do this where there's a question they don't really want to address fully. They will give you a brief and boring statement uh, in a text form and insist that it's attributable only to a spokesperson, even when you know perfectly well the person you're dealing with has drafted that on behalf of the company. And should the media <clears throat> actually make a, make a point, if they can't get the accountability they're looking for, should we make a point of saying exactly who wrote that statement, exactly where it comes from, and give readers, for what it's worth, as much information as possible, and, and also give the message to the people making these statements on behalf of their employers that actually, you know, they're employed by them, and particularly if they're public uh, employees, um, we'll we'll, we'll name the spokesperson who said this uh, on behalf of their institution, if that's the best we can do. Yes, absolutely. And that is what we in the Wellington newsroom here are doing every single time. We are saying to the communications people, you know, your job is to speak to the media on behalf of the company. We are going to name you. Uh, And a lot of the time they say, okay. Uh, A lot of the time, maybe half the time they say no and in that case we say okay well who do we attribute this to like somebody needs to put their name to this because it's your job you know you need to be transparent and accountable so maybe 90 percent of the time and uh, now we are naming the spokespeople who are who are giving those statements there are a few occasions uh, like police or maybe specific immigration cases where there might be a valid reason for not naming that person but i will ask them to explain that and we will, as much as possible, be transparent about why we are not naming that person. The same goes for anonymous sources across the board. I think it's, and we should use those very sparingly. And when we do, we need to explain to readers why we're not naming that person. However, though, Anne, if, if say, one official does front up, take responsibility, puts their name to something and makes a statement to you on something like, for example, the transmission galley delays uh, that you're reporting on right now. I mean, doesn't that one, then sh- you and your reporters, your paper, are going to sheet the responsibility home to them, attach their name to it. And it might be something that's a collective, complicated failure. So if one individual does, um, you know, front up, they'll end up, you know, wearing it in your paper with their name attached to it when it might not be all their fault. So can we blame public servants for being shy of you and perhaps their communications people from trying to shield individuals from the consequences of uh, you know exposure in the media look i readily admit that the media in new zealand stuff has not covered itself in glory uh, all the time in recent years you know there has been a history of clickbait and gotcha kind of stories but we are really trying hard to move past that and stuff has made trust its metric now not uh, not clicks I mean we st- that's a journey we're still uh, on that journey uh, and we want to be held accountable for that too 
there, there will be times when reporters will ask tough questions and that is our job as the fourth estate, as a, as a watchdog to hold the public service to account. But the vast majority of conversations, I think, are or of interviews are this information gathering with the person who is responsible for a department or for a policy. So I think it's reasonable to be able to ask questions of that person um, and to expect answers from them. And, you know, I I think journalists are not out to get uh, public servants. I think that they're looking for, rep uh, you know, uh, proper answers and to be able to hold the public service accountable for for spending taxpayers' money and, and for, you know, what they do on behalf of the public. And uh, Business Desk, um, the outfit founded by uh, veteran journalist Patrick Smelly, um, they now have a project with money from the Public Interest Journalism Fund. So this is a state-funded project, effectively small team reporting on the public service, zeroing in on that. Is that a good idea uh, in this regard? I think it's an excellent idea, and I was kicking myself that I didn't think of it because I think, yeah, it's a great, um, a great initiative, and yeah, exactly what the media should be doing to try to act as that public accountability watchdog. There, I mean, in the fact, of course, the Public Interest Journalism Fund is quite controversial. I get a lot of complaints uh, to me about the fact that we're taking this money, but I always say, you know. It is at arm's distance from the government. We are not beholden to the government. And here is an example of how we use this funding, uh, you know, often to be critical of the government. Uh, and so that is exactly what Business Desk is, is doing there. So, I, yeah, I think it's a really good project, and I'm very interested to see what they produce. And finally, Anna, while you and your reporters might find it hard to get uh, straight answers and on-the-record responses from the public sector and public servants, it's interesting to me that... Some public servants and even some members of the media uh, do take part in conferences that seem to happen fairly frequently about this, which are all about how to engage the public. So these are commercial events by professional conference companies uh, that will have um, sessions and speeches given by public servants and particularly agencies uh, where, I guess, commercial clients sign up, pay a four-figure sum to listen to all this. Um, there are, coincidentally, there are two running simultaneously at the very end of this month. There's one called um, uh, Collaborating with the Media for Mutual Benefit, um, the uh, communications manager of Three Waters Reform for Hamilton City Council, will be talking along with the chief political reporter at News Talk ZB, Jason Walls, uh, about um, how media and communications team can have productive working relationships for both parties. Um, and then at the very same time that's in Wellington, there's another one in Auckland, which sounds almost identical, where public servants, members of the media, public relations uh, professionals are telling these paying clients at these conferences how to engage the media and improve transparency. I mean, weird if this little industry is going on with uh, public servants and the media taking part, and yet you're having the problems you're talking about. Well, yeah, I mean, these kinds of courses and training has been happening for a long time. Uh, that's not new. I would hope that they were using it to encourage them to be more forthcoming, how to be articulate, how to get the message across, you know, how to answer difficult questions. Uh, that kind of training, I think, would be constructive. Um, but I have a sneaky suspicion that that's not what they are teaching them, that this is, yeah, about how not to answer questions um, and how to square out of these kinds of situations. So, you know, of course I don't love that. Um, well, the the focus of the one in Auckland, just to climb in there, sorry, mm. the, the focus of the one in Auckland starting at the end of this month, Anna, is on actually how to maximise social media. So a lot of those sessions are probably about how communications uh, can be done over the top or past the media, direct from uh, whoever it is wants to get the message out to the public via social channels. And that's part of the problem here too, isn't it, that a lot of agencies now are pretty much focused on direct communication uh, with, with the public via their own social channels they control uh, rather than perhaps trying to get the message out via the media. So perhaps you suffer from that regard that they've prioritised that and not communication with, with journalists and, um, and local media outlets like the Don Post.
Yeah, of course. I mean, that enables them to go directly to people, but I think that there's still a really important role for uh, for traditional media to play in there and to be able to ask questions and that a lot of people want us to be asking those questions rather than just hearing the spin, I guess. But um, um, And I, I hope that these working journalists are encouraging the public servants to be more forthcoming, to um, to be as transparent as they can rather than, um, than anything else. Yeah, well, actually, to, to be be fair, that one that Jason Walls of News Talk ZB is taking part in does say uh, the media and communications team can have productive working relationships or they can become trapped in a combative and evasive paradigm which benefits nobody. Uh, so they are actually talking about, yeah, hopefully he'd be telling them the sorts of things that you would want um, a, an audience of people that we're dealing with, journalists and media outlets, to know. Hopefully, yes. That was Anna Fifield, editor of the Daily Paper in the Capital, the Dominion Post, talking to me there about things we didn't learn this week. The paper's new section every weekend, publishing all the questions that public agencies didn't and wouldn't answer from her journalists.